Welcome to the Cancer Council webinar, Exercise and Eating Well, Managing Changes During Cancer Treatment. My name is Meg Chiswell and I work at the Cancer Council in the Cancer Information and Support Service and will be your facilitator this evening. This webinar is for people who are still undertaking treatment for cancer, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Please note that if you have finished your treatment, the information for you is different. Cancer Council ran a webinar on this topic in July. A recording of this webinar and a resource sheet on this topic is available through the Cancer Council website. From our registrations, we are also aware that there are a number of health professionals who have registered for tonight's webinar. Although the webinar tonight is for people who are undergoing cancer treatment, we do hope that tonight's webinar is informative for you. The webinar tonight will also be recorded and made available through the Cancer Council Victoria website. For those who are having treatment for cancer, you may wish to review this again or recommend it to others. For our health professionals, we encourage you to tell your patients about the webinar as an additional information and support resource. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we are meeting on today. We also pay our respects to their elders past and present and all Aboriginal people participating today. Tonight's webinar will run for an hour and a half. The first section of the webinar will consist of presentations from our expert panellists and a panel discussion. For those of you who have not participated in a webinar before, you don't need to do anything during this time except sit back and enjoy the presentation. You may like to have a pen and paper ready to make some notes or jot down some questions that you would like to ask later in the night. Towards the end of our session, we will have a live question and answer segment. At this time, those attending the webinar can post a question to the panel using the question and answer function in the webinar software. During the question and answer time, there will not be a presentation or audio that you hear, but you will be able to read the questions and answers that are submitted and then answered by the panel members. I will spend some more time explaining the question and answer section and how to work this function later in the webinar. If you have any connection problems during the webinar, please call the numbers on your screen quoting the meeting number provided. As I mentioned before, the webinar will be recorded and made available within the next few weeks on the Cancer Council Victoria website. When this is live, you will receive a link to the webinar in a follow-up email from Cancer Council. The recording will not contain a record of the questions and answers from the Q&A section. If during the webinar or after the webinar you still feel like you have some questions, please remember that you can call the Cancer Council on 13 11 20 and speak to a cancer nurse between 9am and 5pm Monday to Friday. During the webinar, some of the presentations will have links to resources or relevant websites. These links are not live during the webinar. You can't click on them to activate them, but they will be provided to you after the session in a follow-up email. To set the scene for tonight, a cancer diagnosis can be quite a shock. There is no right or wrong way to feel when you are faced with cancer. As treatment for cancer begins, many people become aware of changes and losses associated with treatment that impact on well-being. Cancer treatment causes many physical side effects that are different for different people. Some of these may include fatigue, weight gain or weight loss, nausea and loss of appetite. Coping with cancer isn't just about physical issues, the emotional impact is important too. We know that people who experience physical symptoms associated with treatment, such as pain, nausea or fatigue, are more likely to experience um, emotional distress. The good news is that many of the strategies related to eating well and exercise during cancer treatment can also have positive impacts on emotional well-being. Exercise has been shown to help people cope with many of the side effects of treatment, including fatigue, nausea and loss of appetite, anemia, depression and anxiety, and can also help maintain body weight and body composition. Good nutrition can help you cope better with treatment side effects and help wounds or damaged tissues to heal better. 
Good nutrition can also improve your immune system and assist with feelings of having enough energy for everyday tasks. Tonight I'm delighted to let you know that we have a panel of expert presenters who will talk about nutrition and exercise strategies during cancer treatment and how lifestyle factors may improve quality of life and well-being. The full biographies for the presenters this evening are located on the website and I encourage you to revisit the website if you would like to learn some more about our presenters. Our first presenter is Millie Inman. Millie is a creative strategist, travel enthusiast, Cancer Council Victoria speaker and a cancer survivor. In 2009, she was exploring the world during her gap year when she was diagnosed with leukaemia. Through her eight months of treatment, Millie was determined to keep as strong as possible through keeping active and maintaining a balanced diet. Today, Millie strives to assist others undergoing their own individual cancer journeys by sharing her own experiences and personal struggles. It is on this basis that Millie joins us for this evening. Thank you, Millie. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all nice and warm and settled somewhere on this cold night in your own environment. I am Millie Inman, and I'm just going to tell you a very, very brief version of my cancer journey, but I'm going to focus on my personal experience with nutrition and exercise during my treatment. Firstly, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of where my journey started, how my diagnosis affected my nutrition and exercise, some of the ways I coped with these changes and getting back on track after treatment. For me, my journey started when I was 22. I was travelling through Europe for the first time, fell in love for the first time and feeling more alive than ever before. What was meant to be an extended trip was cut very short from the sudden discovery that I had leukaemia and it was very quite progressed. It was one thing to get my head wrapped around being raced back from overseas and facing my illness front on, but I could never have prepared myself for how much it would impact every aspect of my life. I knew from my first round of treatment that I needed to accept the life I knew was on hold, and what was so important was not to look too far ahead, but to take every day and evaluate how I felt, as the day came. Some days my blood levels were so low that even the thought of walking to and from the bathroom seemed impossible. Sometimes the infections I had were so severe that the trip to that bathroom was impossible. And then there were days where I'd be pumped with fresh blood and my counts would jump up and I felt like anything was possible. As a 22 year old girl I was conscious about being fit and for someone that had body images, body, body trouble images in the past I was initially worried about weight gain and losing all my energy. But I reminded myself and was constantly reminded that it was a part of my recovery and what made me feel so terrible at this time was due to the treatment that was making me stronger in the future. Treatment is different for every individual going through their own cancer journey and the chemicals that those t treatments have are completely different and have a different effects on each person. For me, my chemotherapy had a lot of steroids in them and because of this, I did gain a lot of weight. A lot of this weight was also the outcome of constant fluids being pumped into me. To get my head wrapped around this and understand that this was superficial weight that would come straight off definitely takes its emotional toll on you. When you no longer have the energy or the appetite you were used to, it can be very overwhelming. Finding ways to cope with these changes and the ability to adapt a little to the situation you were put in, for me, was heavily influenced by my support network. It didn't matter how bad I felt, when I was surrounded by the people that I love and the people that love me most, I felt so much more hope and motivation to get strong. I was open to trying anything and I knew that everything I was putting into my body was giving me energy and doing good for me. My mum would often bring in juices full of fresh, fresh veggies to help my body feed my body with good nutrients and would cook me well-balanced meals, obviously in conjunction with the meals in hospital. Sometimes my friends would come in with meals from our favourite restaurants and we'd try to pretend that we were there and not on a hospital ward. I had a couple of rounds in which I couldn't eat at all due to infections and was bed bound with space food cooking into me. 
These times would make hospital food seem like a degustation at a Haddock restaurant. Really, putting all your trust in the amazing medical teams is important and remembering that they were always on top of keeping you as strong as possible is vital. When I didn't feel like eating due to certain drugs, the nurses would have a dietitian sent up to my room to find solutions around it. These changes are normal when you're going through something like this and it is difficult to encounter. I think one way I also found coping with what I was going through was to take control in any way I could. So I decided to learn about the process of my treatment and all the medications that were going into my body. I knew about all my bloods and kept a record of my morning results. This helped me understand what my energy levels would be like for that day. On a day where my counts were good and I was feeling a little strength, I would use it as an opportunity to walk laps around the ward. I would try not to push myself and I think, as you will all agree, that when you go through something like this, you are so in touch with, your, with yourself on a journey that we know when enough is enough. I would also take the opportunity when my white cells and immunity came up and was given permission to walk outside the front of the hospital and get fresh air and vitamin D. It was these little pleasures that make the difference and the road lighter. Getting back on track for me seemed daunting, but I was so determined. I wanted to feel the way I felt overseas before it happened. I wanted to be stronger and fitter than I was before. I knew and I'd been told that it takes time that I would get there. What seems so unattainable, I am telling you, isn't. You look back on what you've just overcome and you realise you can do anything. I wanted to do the opposite of lying in a bed for eight months, so I took some time for rehabilitation and then I got up on a plane, still bored, bald, and flew back overseas. When I got there, and yes, this is extreme, but I can be stubborn, I walked 900 k's from France to the border of Spain and Portugal. Take every day as it comes, feel the highs and the lows, trust the team around you, feel the energy from within, and believe that you can do it, because you can. Thank you, Millie. It's so important for those who are experiencing cancer to hear about the experiences of others. Thank you so much for sharing your story and some of the strategies that you used during your cancer treatment. Just a reminder to everyone that Millie and all of our panellists as well as uh, a Cancer Council Oncology nurse will be available to answer questions at the end of the session. I encourage you to write these down and um, as the presentations continue so that you can ask them at the end of the presentation. Our next panellist tonight is Jane Fletcher. Jane is a health psychologist with extensive experience working in the cancer area. She runs a psycho-oncology private practice at Cabrini Health, Malvern and Brighton campuses. She's Deputy Head of the Cabrini Monash Psycho-Oncology Unit and holds an adjunct position at Monash University. Added to her interest in palliative care and gynaecological cancer, Jane has extensive experience dealing with, the issues, with issues such as anxiety, depression and the grief and loss associated with the cancer diagnosis. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. I'm going to spend my time talking about the psychosocial impact of a cancer diagnosis and through treatment. I wanted to share, I guess, some visual things around what it might be like for each of you. The roller coaster is a good metaphor to think about as it's unknown, as there's great uncertainty and there's great highs and lows during treatment. One of the things that many of my patients talk about is the change in the way the body feels in previously knowing what was right for your body and now maybe not having that same intuition, things are different, of not knowing what the next day might bring. Talking about uncertainty, of not really knowing what comes next. This is a unique experience for each of you. There's no comparison with anyone else. It's your journey, it's your path, and at times it may be difficult. People often talk about coping and talking about not coping. I'd just like to remind you that I don't think there's any such thing as not coping. Each of you are going to do this in your own way and you're doing the very best you can at every single moment as you move through this experience. It can be socially isolating. This is where Cancer Council is of paramount importance because they are a link to other people who are going through or have been through, like Millie, a very similar experience. 
It can also provoke great emotional response, such as fear. It can also cause some perhaps less adaptive emotional responses, such as denial. A very useful response in the short term, but not so useful in the longer term. Grief is part of change. Don't be afraid to grieve some of the losses that you might be experiencing. Be true to the emotions that you're going through. Allow yourself to have them and don't be afraid of them. It is okay not to be positive all the time. You're allowed to have down days. We also have to accept that some people will go on to develop more significant issues such as anxiety and depression. Nick spoke about the impact that the physical has on the psychological and it would be very remiss of me not to talk about some of the side effects of treatment such as pain. There are significant issues with fatigue and especially those related to sleep disturbance. It is estimated that something like 80% of individuals going through treatment will have issues um, related to sleep disturbance and this can have a huge impact on fatigue, energy and also our ability to cope from the psychological perspective. Body image can be affected and these issues can be quite significant. It is very difficult for the changes that the side effects of treatment can cause, such as hair loss, for example. And not to forget, and not using this slide flippantly in any way, the impact that it might have on our sexual and intimate relationships. Cancer treatment and illness can have Issues such as pain, low fatigue, low energy, changes in appetite, sleep changes and slowing down of our physical function. And all of these are the same issues that we can experience when we have anxiety or depression. If you're in trouble in relation with your mood, please talk to your health professional about it because it's important that we're asking the right questions because we may think that many of the side effects you're experiencing are relating to your treatment and if we're not asking the right questions, may miss things that are relating to mood. The changes in body, condition, fatigue, lack of motivation, impact on you not being able to do what you used to do before. We talk about the new normal. And all of these, these things have the potential to impact on depression, anxiety, and changes in body image. It's always important to remember that there is no such thing about the normal it is simply a cycle on the washing machine. So what's important to think about is managing your thought processes, trying to avoid catastrophizing, jumping to the worst possible case scenario, going over and over thoughts rumination, worrying multiple uh, possible outcomes without any solution, and fear. I talk about automatic negative thoughts and they will come. You need to be mindful of them. I know certainly what I do when I have ants in my kitchen. I don't encourage more to come. I think about how I might get rid of them, whether take them outside or in fact squash them. So challenge your thoughts. Work hard on what evidence do I have to support that way of thinking? And is there an alternate way of thinking about this? And if there is, follow the Nike principle in life and just do it. Trying to decatastrophize, stopping focusing on one potential outcome which is uniformly a negative thing. Look at other possibilities and bringing your awareness to here and now, the mindfulness approach to life. If you're meditating, keep it up and if you're not, please start. Focusing on living well. Thinking about Wonder Woman, using your cuffs, those silver cuffs to deflect off other people's comments when they're not helpful as you're moving through your treatment pathway. People will give you lots of advice. Trust your health professional team. Putting the good things back into life and relishing them, the small things that bring you joy, sitting in the garden with a cup of tea, enjoying the sunshine on your face, taking control of what is in your control and recognising that many of the things that used to be in your control for this period of time may not be. Choose how you live right now in this moment. Recognising that some of the pieces may not fit together right now. Give yourself time, be kind to yourself and remember to laugh. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and what a great slide to finish 
um, Jane's presentation on. I don't think I've ever seen such a happy camel. Um, thank you, Jane. And if any of Jane's presentation has raised questions for you, uh, please remember to drop these down for the question and answer section at the end. Our next presenter is Lauren Muir. Lauren is an accredited practicing dietitian with five years experience in oncology and haematology. Lauren has extensive experience in managing nutrition related difficulties from diagnosis through to survivorship and currently works at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Meg. Now, nutrition can have an effect on all stages of a person's cancer journey. Tonight, our focus will be on nutrition during cancer treatment. It is possible that your nutrition needs and goals during cancer treatment will differ from those before and after your treatment. This session aims to empower you with some strategies on how to optimise your nutritional intake during your treatment and considering the side effects that may come with it. Cancer can impact our ability to take in and utilise nutrients. The location of the tumour can impact our ability to ingest, digest or absorb our food, particularly if areas of the mouth, throat or gastrointestinal tract are involved. In some cases, the cancer can increase our body's metabolic demand or increase our energy and protein needs. The psychological impact of a cancer diagnosis and the stress of treatment can also change the way we feel about and process food. On top of the impact of cancer itself, we then add treatment. Whether it's surgery, chemo or radiotherapy or other therapies, these can all have significant effects on our nutritional status. It's important to discuss with your doctor or nurse how your treatment might affect your nutrition and request a dietitian referral if needed. Shown here are some of the potential side effects that can impact our ability to eat and drink and can certainly put your body at risk of malnutrition. Many of these will depend on the type of treatment you're receiving and where your cancer is located. What is malnutrition? It refers to the imbalance of nutrients that can impact our health and well-being. In cancer, an inadequate intake of energy or calories and protein can lead to a loss of fat and muscle stores, which can lead to malnutrition. This can also happen if someone is overweight. Malnutrition in cancer is associated with reduced tolerance to treatment, increased hospital admissions and length of stay, complications after procedures and poor quality of life. It can also affect your overall treatment outcomes. Unfortunately, malnutrition in cancer is common. A recent large Victorian study found that 31 to 78 per cent of our cancer patients are malnourished. Given these high rates, the goals of nutrition intervention during treatment are focused around managing side effects to enable you to meet your nutritional needs and minimise unintentional weight loss, particularly from your muscle stores. Loss of lean body mass is where we run into trouble with treatment tolerance, immune function and complications. If you are experiencing any side effects that are stopping you from eating normally, it's important to link in with a dietitian at your health service. The Cancer Council's Nutrition and Cancer Booklet is also a really useful guide that provides some practical strategies to help manage some of these side effects. Changes to your appetite are quite common during cancer treatment. In many cases, our bodies need more energy and protein than usual, but you feel like eating less. Smaller, more frequent meals can help. Eating often can also help your body to expect food, which can assist your appetite. Because you may not feel like it, using reminder systems can be useful to set time points to eat something. Choosing foods that are nutritious and high in energy and protein can help if you can only face small amounts of food. To guide you through deciding on a suitable balanced diet, it's important to focus on foods that are high in protein. These are really helpful for preservation of your muscle mass. These may be foods found from animals like meat, chicken, fish, eggs, or very vegetarian options like tofu, lentils, baked beans, chickpeas, nuts, and seeds. Then we think about adding a carbohydrate source. 
such as breads and cereals, pasta, starchy vegetables like pumpkin and corn. Legumes like chickpeas and lentils are also useful here. A dietitian can help you select the most appropriate carbohydrate foods for your condition. The next step is to add fruits and vegetables, ideally of a variety of colours. If your appetite is lacking, in some cases it may be best that you eat your protein portion of your meal first. Dairy products are an important part of the diet and can provide us with extra energy and protein. Full cream varieties may be best if you're having trouble keeping weight on. Then you can fortify your meals with fats and oils, including avocado. This is particularly useful if you're losing weight and feeling full quickly when eating. It is also really important that you remain hydrated. And in some cases it can be helpful to include fluids that also provide your body with protein and nutrients. This may be through milkshakes and smoothies. Some people may benefit from adding powders such as skim milk powder or commercial supplement powders like Sustagen and Ensure. If you're not sure if you're getting the right balance of nutrients or are losing weight, be sure to link it with a dietitian who can provide you with individualised and tailored advice to you and your goals. As a dietitian, I'm often asked if there is a particular diet that should be followed or if certain foods are considered good or bad for cancer. There is no evidence that any diet or set of foods will prevent, cure or ensure that a cancer does not recur. There is a wealth of information out there and unfortunately not all sources are trustworthy. Many therapies are dangerously marketed as a cure for cancer when there is little or no evidence to support this. Making large changes to your diet can have a range of negative effects and can even interfere with the effectiveness of your cancer treatment. If you're thinking of modifying your diet drastically or cutting out particular food groups, I really urge you to discuss this with your healthcare team to make sure that it won't cause you harm or interfere with your treatment. My advice when it comes to dietary supplements is to only replace what you need and ideally to get it from natural food sources. Dietitians are trained to analyse your dietary intake as well as your biochemical and clinical markers like blood tests to identify any deficiencies in your diet. It's much better to, re to replace or supplement only the nutrients that you may be lacking. I encourage you all to be very open and honest about anything you are taking or wish to take so you and your team can work together to find the best balance for you. Nutrition can have an impact on all stages of a, cat, a person's cancer journey and is an element of your care that you can have some control over. If you have any questions or concerns regarding your diet, link in with a dietitian for tailored, individualised advice for your cancer journey. These are often free through your health service. Or to get information on how to access a dietitian, ask your treating team or call the Cancer Council Support Line on the number listed or visit the Dietitians Association of Australia website. If you're interested in further information, these websites may be of interest. And I believe there are some health professionals uh, tuned in today. There is a free online education program to upskill you in the area of malnutrition and cancer that is tailored to a range of different health professions, as well as a toolkit that might be useful for your organisation. Thank you for listening in. Thank you, Lauren. And just a reminder that all of the links that are um, presented in the presentations today, as well as some links to some other resources, will be made available to all people who register for the webinar um, by email in the next few weeks. So our final presenter today is Katrina. Uh, Katrina is an accredited exercise physiologist specialising in chronic disease management, including cardiorespiratory, metabolic and cancer. She has recently joined the ex exercise physiology team at Peter Mac uh, Cancer Centre um, and to that her role there involves providing targeted exercise programs aimed at improving cancer patients' outcomes through exercise. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Meg. Tonight I'll be providing some information on strategies for staying active during your treatment. Exercise plays a role in cancer in three main ways. Firstly, it plays a role in cancer prevention. There's strong evidence to show that maintaining a healthy body weight and undertaking regular exercise can decrease the risk and incidence of some cancers. 
Secondly, during treatment, exercise is utilised to help manage treatment-related symptoms such as fatigue or feelings of weakness and can improve one's physical functioning, mood and quality of life. Finally, it plays a major role in the recovery process. People who engage in regular physical activity throughout their cancer journey are less likely to experience recurrence or secondary com complications. As Jane mentioned, some commonly reported physical effects of cancer and related treatments include fatigue, poor coordination or unsteadiness, loss of muscle mass and weight, nausea and vomiting, and pain. You may experience one or more of these physical effects during your treatment, but the good news is that with the right mix of exercise and correct timing getting started, physical activity can help minimise and reverse some of these effects. For example, by sticking to a general strengthening and conditioning program, you can limit the amount of muscle mass you will lose and better maintain your heart and lung function, otherwise known as cardiorespiratory fitness. Deconditioning is a complex multi-system. A number of factors, including comorbidities and various cancer treatments, result in impaired cardiorespiratory fitness, which ultimately affects the ability to deliver treatment. For many cancer patients and survivors, a natural response to feeling fatigued and depressed is to decrease physical activity. This has traditionally been compounded by healthcare workers and families advising people to take it easy, leading to reluctance on the part of the patients to undertake exercise, especially during treatment. People are likely to stop exercising altogether, either due to fatigue, feeling unwell, or because they believe they need to rest. As you can see here, deconditioning is a vicious cycle. A decrease in activity level leads to a change in our muscle and bone strength and our cardiorespiratory fitness. This makes it increasingly difficult for us to manage day-to-day -day activities, which then affects our mood and perception of self, negatively impacting our quality of life. This then makes us feel more fatigued and less able to remain active. The cycle then continues and we become more and more deconditioned. The key to breaking this cycle is to remain as active as possible throughout treatment to avoid large declines in function. Before taking part in an, any exercise program, it is important to talk to your oncologist or GP as there will be some considerations and safety precautions. If it's been a while since you've been active and your fitness level is low, you'll need to start slowly and build up gradually. Try not to do too much too soon. Exercise does not need to be expensive. People often buy gym equipment that lives in the spare room and doesn't get used. A walking program only requires a pair of runners to get you on your way. Starting a program may be overwhelming and you may have lots of questions. You could benefit from seeing a professional such as an exercise physiologist to help you with your program. An EP can work with you and your doctor to develop a program that's tailored for your needs. And finally, the most important thing is to choose an activity or program that you enjoy, as this will promote long-term adherence and compliance. So how much exercise should I do during treatment? The recommendations for cancer are very broad and depend on many factors. It is important to remember that if you've been inactive for some time, or if you're experiencing severe fatigue or pain, you may need to start slowly and gradually and work your way up. Ideally, you should undertake 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most days of the week. But if you feel unable to complete this all, this all at once, you can always break the sessions up into smaller bouts, such as three 10 minute blocks across the course of the day. Of course, there are likely to be times when this is going to be unrealistic due to treatment side effects and you'll need to back off. Activities such as walking or stationary cycling are popular choices and it is also beneficial to add some weight training to your routine to ma maintain strength of muscles and bones. You may need to seek help to get started, especially if you've had no experience with using weights. Finally, it is vital that you remember that you are the best judge of how much your body can handle during treatment. It is so important that you listen to it. There are specific precautions that you may need to keep in mind. If you've had severe weight loss, you may need to limit yourself to light intensity exercise only due to the loss of muscle and body fat. 
If you experience bone pain or have compromised skeletal integrity, you need to avoid activities that increase the risk of fracture, such as running, contact sports or heavy weight training. If you have peripheral neuropathy, post-chemotherapy, you may have some weakness and or balance issues. This doesn't mean you can't exercise, but you need to be careful with what type you choose. For example, an exercise bike may be a better option for you than walking. Also, be careful in water environments. Chemotherapy can have an impact on your immune system, which increases the risk of infection. It's always a good idea to check with your medical team prior to getting back in the pool. Once again, it's important that you discuss these issues with your GP or oncologist or get a referral to an accredited exercise physiologist before you begin. Here are listed a few resources to help get you started. If you prefer at a group setting, oncology rehab programs have really gained momentum over the past two years and run at a number of different health services and organisations. For those not familiar with such programs, they usually involve a nurse, a physio and an EP who will run 45 to 60 minute exercise sessions twice weekly for six to eight weeks. You can make use of the MBS, which allows people to attend five sessions per year with an allied health professional such, such as an exercise physiologist. Speak to your GP about this program as they will need to make the referral. Private health insurance funds do cover both EP and physio interventions and might be something that you can take advantage of. And finally, the Cancer Council has lots of good resources, including the booklet Exercise for People Living with Cancer, which talks through most of the things I've covered here today. It's normal to experience setbacks as you start or return to physical activity. To promote your own success, choose an activity that's both enjoyable and challenging. If something is too hard or too easy, you'll lose interest pretty quickly. It's important um, it can also help if you have a variety of activities that you undertake over the course of the week so you don't get bored. Goal setting is a very important process. You need to consider realistic and achievable short and long term goals. Sometimes people find it helpful to work out with someone else or in a group environment for motivation and support. But putting exercise into your weekly schedule and planning ahead can help those who find little time to exercise. Keeping a training diary of your exercise can be beneficial as this allows you to monitor your progress over time and technology really helps in this area. Devices such as Fitbits, heart rate monitors, watches and phone apps work really well. Lastly, acknowledge bad days. Things will not always go according to plan. How you feel day to day can fluctuate. Try not to let it get you down. Rest if you need to. Ask for help along the way. Acknowledge bad days and move on. Lastly, there are some great resources on exercise for cancer patients on these sites. Alternatively, you can contact me at PDMAC and I will be happy to point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and some more great tips there. At this time, we'll be joined by all of our panellists for a short question and answer section. Um, and I wondered for our first question if we may ask this question to Millie. Millie, in your presentation, we saw um, some fabulous photos of you surrounded by your friends and you spoke very highly of your support network. Sometimes on our 13 11 20 information and support line, we hear of experiences of, of people who find that after a cancer diagnosis, sometimes there's a change in friendships where perhaps friends might stay away because they're unsure of what to say. Um, can I ask, did, did you have any experiences like that or has um, your cancer experience changed your friendships in any way? I think this is really normal. Um, my support network really were a huge part of my recovery. Uh, most of my friends did not surprise me in the way they reacted to my diagnosis. But in saying this, I did have a few friends that found my illness to be very overwhelming and because of this struggled to be quite present while I was going through treatment, but of course I knew they were still there, there for me. And then I had other friends that really stepped up and, you know, were in there every second day of the whole eight months of my treatment. And I think my friendships now are so strong, I'll forever be in debt to the way they looked after me and really for keeping me alive. Thanks, Millie. Um, Jane, this relates a little bit to some of uh, your work. So from your experiences as, as a psychologist working with cancer patients, is that um, situation where, where sometimes um, 
close family members or friends withdraw? Is that a common experience and why do you think that happens? It's an incredibly common experience. What people tend to find is that some people are away from them during their cancer experience. As Millie said, some people will step up, some people will come out of the woodwork. But people tend to step away when they've perhaps had a cancer experience themselves that has caused them great distress, sense of loss, perhaps in fact they know someone who's actually died from that experience and that could be why they remove themselves. However, we have to choose the supports carefully and that's the one piece of advice I would give is to recognise the additive people in your life and recognise your phone of friends, people, the people you can count on and talk to them. Let them know that they're the phone of friends, people. They're the people that might get a telephone call at two in the morning and know that they're going to be there for you and use those supports rather than trying to put your energy into the people who aren't going to be there for you. Okay. Jane, with your presentation, you made um, <coughs> references to the impact of a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment can have on um, intimate relationships and personal relationships. What suggestions you, would you give people um, who are in that situation? The best thing I can say is to be open, be honest and talk. I have a, an anecdote about a, a, a patient of mine who had a, a diagnosis of cancer, went home very distressed with her husband and said to him, I'm going to lay on the bed. That was code for, I want to cuddle, come and lie with me, give me support. He didn't understand the code because she didn't say it. She went and had a lay on the bed, was very distressed. Woke up two hours later to hear banging. He was building her a pergola. An argument ensued and when we spoke about it in therapy, they laughed about it, but at the time it was very distressing. And it could have been easily averted. Recognise that we're apples and pears and we speak differently and we have to be really clear with what we want. If we need help, we need to ask for it. If we want intimacy, we may need to ask for a cuddle. And we get the same release of oxytocin, the wonderful chemical that gets released into our brain when we touch someone, whether we ask for the cuddle or whether it's free coming, it doesn't matter, the same release is the same release and so it's useful regardless. So the best thing I can say is to communicate and be open and honest. Thanks Jane. Um, for those who are listening, you may not be aware that um, by calling 13 11 20 um, you can access uh, some counselling services that are related to intimacy and relationships. Um, that's a specialist service that's available through Cancer Council. My next question is for Lauren. Lauren, in some of the questions that come in from people who registered for the webinar, they reported uh, weight gain during cancer treatment and Millie touched on this a little bit in her presentation as well. Um, weight gain is not often expected um, during cancer, cancer treatment. Can you give some practical strategies about managing weight gain during treatment? Yeah, certainly. Look. We often focus on undernutrition or malnutrition during cancer treatment because we know the rates of malnutrition are so high and it can have a significant effect on, on cancer treatment. Uh, but at the same time, some people do find that they put on weight during treatment and this can be for a variety of reasons and can be understandably frustrating. The first thing I always like to consider is what the cause of that weight gain is. And Millie alluded to some of her experiences before and things like fluctuations in fluids, the use of steroid-based medications and other medications can all contribute to weight gain. And this might be false weight gain that will resolve once those medications or treatments have ceased. I guess if trying to lose weight during cancer treatment, it's really important to be sensible and realistic if this is your goal. And my my biggest tip would be to discuss this with your medical team or dietitian to make sure it's safe and appropriate to do so. Just by discussing this, they might be able to enlighten you as to why you've gained weight. And it could be that it is for a reason other than, other than what you can manage yourself. If you're well enough and the treating team are happy with your goals, it's really important to consider both nutrition and exercise in combination when aiming for weight loss. Link yourself in with a dietitian, but also an exercise physiologist and make sure that they, they're communicating between themselves as well. You'll be able to achieve a lot more if you've got a team working for you, but also working together. Thanks, Lauren. 
So Lauren, in your presentation, this might be something that you could answer or perhaps Jane um, could feed into, you talked about um, the, that sometimes people aren't um, honest with their health professionals about special diets that they might be on or complementary complementary medicines that they might be taking. Why do you think that might be, in your experience? Why, why is it that people are reluctant to have those conversations with their health professionals? Hmm. Look, I think in, in some cases it's the the person undergoing the treatment trying to be protective of their healthcare team. And I think recognising that the medical profession and the, the healthcare system that they're working in is often focused on evidence-based practice, which might, which the therapies that they're interested in might fall outside of at the, the current point in time. Um, and I think it's, it's seen as a bit of um, something that people don't want to discuss because they feel like they're doing something wrong or not in line with what their medical therapists are recommending. That's certainly not the case and I think it's something that um, if we think about how chemotherapies are developed, often there's, they've been developed from natural substances which initially would have been something that would have been considered a complementary therapy but is now standard conventional medicine. And so discussing anything that you've read about, that you're interested in or wanting to take with your team should be a common commonplace and should be something you feel very comfortable doing. So people should feel confident to raise those conversations and, and have those conversations with their healthcare team so that all of the necessary considerations can be made and you can get the best possible advice. Absolutely. And you'll probably find that the team involved is very interested in the things that you're interested in taking. And they've got the skills, the, the databases, the connections to really explore in, in greater depth the safety and the efficacy of those therapies that you've explored. Thanks, Lauren. Did you want to add anything to that, Jane? I just wanted to say that um, the honest and open communication is also with the relationship with your health professional. And I think one of the issues that many people face is that because something's natural, not realising that it may have an interaction with some of the treatments they're on, and so anything that you're taking orally, anything you may be placing inside your body, it's important to let your treatment team know because they can then advise you as to whether they think that that's an okay thing to be doing, whether they think that that perhaps has potential interactions with the treatments that you're on and maybe negating some of those treatments. And I think that's, that's the open and honest communication is important. Thanks, Jane. So the next question is one submitted by one of our webinar participants. And this question is for Katrina. So Katrina, this question is about how much exercise is too much. And uh, the person that submitted this question really reflected that sometimes when you're having a bit of a rough day and you're not really feeling particularly well, you have to push yourself to exercise. And that's okay because you know, you, you, you know that you need to do some exercise. But if you're feeling unwell, how, how can you be sure that you're not pushing yourself too hard? So how much exercise is too much exercise? It's an interesting question. Once again, it's going to vary from person to person, um, depending on the type of cancer, the type of treatment, and what stage you're at. It's also going to depend on how active you were prior to beginning your treatment. For some people, going for a short walk will be incredibly challenging, as Millie mentioned before. Um, certain days, that's going to be really difficult. Other times won't be so hard and other people are going to have a completely different experience where they're able to do a lot more. Um, our recommendation is that people engage in 30 minutes of moderate activity on most days of the week and by that we mean enough to raise your heart rate and breathing a little but not so much that you can't speak. These are pretty general guidelines however and don't account for the fact that you're likely to have bad days where this will be too much. The best advice I can give you is to listen to your body. If you're waking up sore or tired the day after you exercise, you may, may be overdoing it. Um, I guess the other consideration is to be honest with yourself about whether you're really feeling symptomatic or, or you're just not enjoying the exercise or don't really understand how important it is to complete it. Um, and that might be a conversation that you need to have with your healthcare team as well, if it's a, actually a physical um, or more of a motivational issue for you. Thanks, Katrina. Millie, um, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about um, having those days where you felt like you could do a little bit more, even when you were quite sick in the ward, and you talked about laps of the ward. 
Um, if you could reflect on how you how you managed to work out what the right balance of physical activity was for you on those on those days that were were a little bit tougher. Um, I think, as Katrina said, it did just every day I took as it came, um, and I knew that if I'd had you know, refills or bags of blood that day that had given me, you know, up to my red counts, I knew I had the energy, then I knew that I could get out of bed because I could feel it, but I would do maybe 20 minutes of just, you know, not fast laps. Sometimes I'd wheel my my blood thing around with me, but I'd do as much as I could, and then when I started to tire out or, you know, I'd, I'd done 20 or so minutes, then I, I knew that I needed to rest so that I didn't push myself and, you know, make it detrimental to what I'd already, my recovery so far. So I think it was really just being in touch with myself and feeling what I, you know, what I knew was enough. You talked a little bit in your presentation as well about getting out into the sunshine and the fresh air. What did that do for your mood on those on those days when you were able to get out and about into the fresh air? Um, I, I think that you realise how important the little things are. I remember not being allowed to go outside so often because my counts were too low and the germs outside. So when I was given permission to go out there and just sit, even if it was just sitting on the grass, it just, I don't know, it made me so motivated and gave me so much hope. Just to, just made that day that bit better and I, your whole perspective on everything changes. You, you're so cooped up and amongst patients and everything medical that when you can just get outside and get a little bit of sun or fresh air and, and clear your mind. It's, it's so vital to the way you feel, like emotionally as well. Thanks, Millie. I've got one more question for Katrina. Um, Katrina, I'm aware from, and from your presentation as well that there can be changes in bone density and muscle mass during treatment. I wondered if you might be able to talk about some typical approaches that an exercise physiologist may suggest to address these types of changes. Yeah, for sure. It is an unfortunate side effect of the treatment and bed rest that once we stop loading our bones and muscles, they decondition very quickly. Um, the good news is that bones and muscles respond well to weight-bearing activities. So even getting up and going for a walk, doing some light weights, housework or gardening will promote bone growth and muscle strength. An exercise physiologist, if you uh, have an assessment with them, can develop a tailored strength program which will focus on appropriately loading muscles and bones. The intensity of these exercises is going to vary from person to person. Um, if it's appropriate for you, some higher intensity activities such as running or jumping might be also included, but there are safety considerations based on the type of cancer and treatment. So once again, it's always really important to get an individual assessment. There isn't a general guideline for, for how we would prescribe um, strength training. Did you want to add something additional, Lauren? I, one thing I would say, in, in I guess in collaboration with that exercise, particularly if you're doing resistance exercise to rebuild muscle mass, is it would be really beneficial to have a protein-based meal within 30 minutes after that exercise. That can help to rebuild those lean, bus, lean muscle stores to accelerate the rebuilding of your muscle stores. Thanks, Lauren. And I think the message that we're getting through from all of our panellists today is to really work closely with the healthcare team um, around all of these types of things. So, Jane, sometimes we receive queries to 131120 information and support about relaxation and mindfulness exercises. Um, firstly, I wondered if you might talk a little bit about what mindful mindfulness exercises are. So mindfulness is a pro a, an approach of focus of attention. Simply a focus of attention on any particular task is being mindful of that task. Mindfulness exercises are things like yoga, tai chi, qigong. They are not necessarily going to improve your cardiovascular fitness, but they certainly will have an impact on the way you ride the waves, how you cope with the experience. Yoga can be particularly helpful in relation to lymphedema as well, so um, that can also be of note. Um, and there's significant evidence coming out about its uh, role in relation to fatigue. There's some evidence about radiotherapy-related fatigue and Tai Chi, so there is some evidence about the mindfulness exercises. But they are very good for our psychological well-being, as is mindfulness in general and mindfulness meditation. Relaxation techniques are very powerful in helping us be able to 
again ride the wave. So work on a particular part of your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is involved in your fight and flight response and it is very, very helpful in reducing our physiological anxiety, our physiological arousal. That can help us increase our ability to just function in the world. There is absolutely no evidence that mindfulness meditation relaxation strategies will improve survival, but they do improve compliance, so making you more likely to engage in positive exercise and dietitian nutrition strategies. The one thing I did want to add about exercise is um, in relation to psychological function, and it is important if you are demotivated and you're struggling to motivate yourself to recognise that this may be an aspect of depression. It is very common for people who have a cancer to find that their mood becomes, low, becomes lowered. You may not meet what we call criteria for depression, but it may be worth talking to your treatment team about strategies. The irony is exercise is a treatment for depression, and in fact, sometimes we can find that it's hard to motivate ourselves to do the exercise that's going to be helpful. So, as Katrina said, start small, do, do small things, pace yourself, and often do it with someone else. Get a buddy, it's going to help to motivate you. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to wrap up our panel discussion. Um, I would like to ask each of our panellists for a key message for people who are undergoing uh, treatment for cancer, and I'd like to start with Katrina. So when it comes to moving, anything is better than nothing. Do what you can, listen to your body, be kind to yourself if you miss exercise on bad days and get back to it when possible. Always ask for help from an accredited exercise physiologist if you're unsure about starting your program. Work really closely with your healthcare team. And Lauren? I'd encourage you to use your food choices as a way you can contribute to your cancer care. Select a range of foods from a variety of food groups and if you're experiencing any difficulties, arrange an appointment with a dietitian. Use your healthcare team around you to serve you well. Millie? Uh, I think it's really important to just live every day in the present. So take every day as it comes and, and feel the highs and lows. Uh, don't get caught up if you have a bad day. Tomorrow might be completely different. Always trust your medical team around you. and. Jane? I'd say to be kind to yourself, to not set the expectation too high, the bar too high, not to push too high, and make sure there's joy in every day, joy in the small things. There's always something that you can do that will make your heart sing and just try and engage in those joyful moments. Thank you, Jane. So I'd like to thank all of our panellists tonight for sharing their knowledge and for providing us with some excellent advice and practical strategies on this topic. Our panellists will be available until 8.30 tonight to answer your questions. For those of you who still have um, some questions and uh, aren't able to stay for the Q&A, I do encourage you to ring 13 11 20 at the Cancer Council to talk to an oncology nurse and access reliable information and relevant support services. At this time, we're going to transition from the webinar presentations to the question and answer or Q&A session. Some of you may choose at this time to end your participation in the webinar, and if you do, we thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you.